But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom do you seek? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell, him, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, you may be seated. Thank you, Dan. When I was serving at Wesley United Methodist Church in Morgantown, a coffee shop near the church, downtown Morgantown, where I served, uh, I frequented it often. A college student approached me in that coffee shop, and he said, Dr. Ramsey, you've been attending your church. And I said, wonderful. He introduced himself, and, and he said, well, it's been quite an experience because the truth is I haven't been in church since I was six years old. But now that I'm back in college, I thought I would try to, to give it a try, and I, I've enjoyed it. I said, good. And he, and he paused, but then he, and he said, now, I don't mean any disrespect, but a lot of times when I leave, I leave with more questions than answers. And I said to him, well, I'm not offended at all. In fact, I've found in my own faith journey that it's hard to know the answer if you don't know what the question is. And how many times a question holds the seed or the beginning of an answer. And friends, that is the truth of the Easter narrative. There are four urgent questions of Easter throughout the Easter narrative. And in these questions, we are pointed toward the answer. So I invite you to hear that good news of the four urgent questions of Easter. And the first two appeared in John's gospel that Dan read. The first one, why are you weeping? Why are you weeping? I think Jesus asks that question, first of all, because he wants to know why we're crying. He wants to know where we're hurting. He wants to know how we are broken. Why are you weeping? And Jesus himself in John 11, he wept. So he wants to know. He understands. At the same time, in that question, why are you weeping? Because the question is asked by the risen Savior, He's pointing us toward another answer, and that is there is a day available to you in which every tear can be dried. So why are you weeping? Death has not the final word. Why are you weeping? You know, the first time it happened to me, I was burying an aged saint of one of the churches that I was serving, and we went out to a cemetery, and we were walking with the casket, and just as we placed the casket at the grave... There was an elementary school just next to the cemetery, and it led out for recess. The bell rang, and just as we laid her casket on the grave, and I was getting ready to say those final solemn words, here come screaming kids, sounds of laughter, sounds of joy echoing across the cemetery. And some might say, wow, what an interruption. But no, maybe we were interrupted in a wonderful way because what I did was for that family and knowing the faith of this lady, I just said, let's turn, and look at the, let's turn and look at the playground. And there they were, laughing and screaming. And I said to the family, it's like that. It's like that. Weeping may last for a season, but joy comes in the morning with the Jesus who lives. And the truth is, it happened just this week again. Did you know that? 
Tuesday, just this past Tuesday, we had a funeral here for another great faithful lady of our church in her 90s, Alice Brake. And wouldn't you know it, just as we took her casket out to put her in the funeral coach, the elementary school across the street, recess. And so echoing across our parking lot to this grieving family, laughter and joy and excitement. Friends, it's like that. Do you understand? Why are you weeping? It's okay to weep because God understands your grief and hurting. But at the same time, he provides you the answer that life is victorious. There is joy even in the very face of death. I know I cannot tell you the exact date and time in which your weeping will cease. But I do know this. It will happen at the rising of the sun. The second urgent question also appears there in John's gospel. Whom do you seek? Whom do you seek? What are you looking for in life? Most people would say, I'm looking for gladness. I'm looking for joy. I'm looking for peace and purpose and fulfillment. And today, I just need a sense of calm. I, I'm seeking direction and guidance for my future. Whom do you seek? We can find this in Jesus. What we are seeking is found in the risen Jesus. But sometimes we're just looking in the wrong places. People in our culture looking in the wrong places. You know, the tradition in my own family on Easter morning, my parents would buy us one Easter gift. It wasn't a candy thing or eggs. It was an Easter gift of some sort. And we had to search for that Easter gift. When we woke up on Easter morning, they had hid it somewhere. We had to search it out. Now, as we got older, the hiding places become a little more difficult. And I remember one Easter, I looked to all the usual places, couldn't find it. So I remember looking at my parents and I said, it's not here. It's not here. And my mom simply said, reminded me, oh, it's here. You're just looking in the wrong places. In fact, this picture hangs in my office. This picture of the Last Supper was one of those Easter gifts that I had difficulty finding, but I finally found it. It's here. You're just looking in the wrong places. Now, there may be people, maybe you one of them, or people that you know. They hear preacher kind of talking preacher talk on Easter. And he, and he talks about joy and purpose and life. And there are people in our world today that would look at that because of the circumstances that they're facing. And they may say, you know, it's not here, Ken. I like hearing you talk about peace and calm. It's not here. I like hearing you talk about joy and gladness. But for me, it's just not here. And I say unto you, it is here. It is Sometimes we, we just got to wait, and sometimes we're looking in the wrong places because Jesus emerged from the tomb victorious. Because Jesus lives, that which you seek, fulfillment and peace and guidance, it is here, and it is found in his presence. Now, I cannot tell you the exact date and time when you will find what you're seeking, but I can tell you this. You will find what you're seeking at the rising of the sun. The third urgent question of Easter comes from Mark's gospel. You can see it there in your bulletin. I'm not going to read the entire uh, gospel account. I simply want to call your attention to the question that emerges. As they approached the tomb there in Mark's narrative, they asked the question, who will roll away the stone? Who will roll away the stone? Who will remove the barriers that are keeping people in the bondage of injustice and oppression? Who will roll away the stone of anger and bitterness that entomb so many people today? Heard an old preacher one time. He said, now I want you to know I'm talking to the church. Don't be pointing a finger somewhere else. I'm talking to you Christians. I've learned that there's three kinds of people. There's stone throwers. There's stone setters. And there's stone rollers. And he said, we serve a God who is a stone roller. 
I never forgot that because he was so true. When it comes to stones, some people want to pick them up and throw them at other people. Then you've got stone setters. They're the ones that set the stone in place, try to keep other people in the tomb, keep people in their place so that they cannot enjoy the life and joy that's available to all of us. I just set that stone to keep them where they belong. But friends, it's Easter. We serve a God who has rolled the stone away. I told him I wanted to say a rolling stones God, but I thought you'd think about the rock group and, and get distracted. So I've already distracted. No, we serve a God, as Max Licato says, he still moves stones. So whatever that stone is in your life or in the life of someone you love, is it a stone of unresolved grief? Is it a stone of anger or bitterness that you've held on to for too long? Is it a stone where some failure in the past keeps coming back to haunt you? Is it a stone of circumstance or situation? Friends, know today that Jesus promises to roll that stone away for you and for me. And as the church of Jesus Christ, we are called to, roll those, to help roll those stones away for other people so that they might experience the life that God has for them. You know, when I was doing my doctorate degree at United Theological Seminary in Dayton, Ohio, our leader was Reverend Art Tucker. Reverend Art Tucker. Art was a former military guy, excellent physical condition, always prided himself on, on being strong. And he carried this very large briefcase, very large briefcase. We used to kind of poke fun at him about it. Well, one time as we were going into the cafeteria for lunch, he left his briefcase out in the entryway, went in for lunch, and a and a, an honorary member of our doctoral group, who shall remain nameless, <laughs> had the idea of going out in the rock garden that was out in front of the cafeteria there at United, and I found several heavy stones, and I put them inside Art's briefcase, and then I closed it. And then we waited, because when lunch was over, he picked up his briefcase, and he started towards the library. And you could see him. It was a hot day. He was walking across. But he wasn't giving in. I couldn't stand any longer, so I, I walked up aside, I ran up beside, I said, all right, I said, let me help you with that. Oh, no, no, I've got it, he says. I said, no, no, really, put it down and let me help you. He put it down, I opened it up, and I started taking out these stones. I'll never forget, Art, he kind of wiped his brow, and he said, thank goodness, he said, I thought it was me. I thought it was me. People are carrying around stones. Maybe you are carrying around a stone, and you've carried it too long. Friends, it's Easter God rolls stones away. And we need to be people, Easter people, who not only receive that message but offer it instead of adding to people's burdens like I did. Instead of adding to people's burdens, people that are already burdened. We go out there and we add to their burden. No, no, no. We need to be rolling those stones away and lifting their burden. Now, I cannot... I cannot tell you the exact date and time when those stones will be rolled away in your life or in the life of someone that you love, but I can tell you this. You will find it rolled away at the rising of the sun. Finally, fourth urgent question of Easter is in Luke's account. Again, I'll not read the entire account. It's there for you. But there's a question there. Do you see it toward the end of the passage? Why do you seek the living among the dead? Why do you seek the living among the dead? You desire life. You desire abundant life. You desire eternal life. You desire authentic and genuine life. Then why are you looking for that life in ways that only lead to death? Christ is risen. Life is here. I know that in our culture today that Christian faith and other faith has really dwindled in people's lives. Did you know that? Did you know that in just the last two decades, people who claim no religious affiliation has nearly tripled? Among millennials, 35% of millennials in our country claim no, none, N-O-N-E is the box that they check when asked about religious affiliation. Now, it's easy for us, you know, good self-righteous Christian people to kind of shake our head in disgust and wag our finger and those millennials and... 
But maybe we need to be, instead of doing that, looking in the mirror and saying, are we presenting the gospel? Are we representing life and love? Are we living a life of love? So that people of all generations would want to experience that risen Lord in their life. Instead of being accusatory, we need to be inviting. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Reminds me of a pastor friend of mine who served a city in the Midwest. He was on his way to lunch one day and he saw a well-dressed lady who was being approached by a homeless man. And he said as he approached her, she overreacted. She said to him, get away from me. You disgust me. And he said two college-age young men were near there as well. And he said as they, they walked by, they actually said, hey, hey, lady, take it easy on him. Take it easy. And she said, you don't know me. I'm a good Christian woman. And my friend overheard the other college-age young man say, which explains why I'm not. Which explains why I'm not a Christian. It's a challenge to represent life when death and despair and destruction are all around because we can easily give in to it ourselves. It's a challenge, but friends, we represent the living, the living Lord, the living Christ, not death. And we can search around and stumble around in the dark, but ultimately the victory that is ours in Jesus Christ will find us one way or another. In closing, right here in this very sanctuary several years back, well, it hasn't been that long, I guess, but our youth group was holding a lock-in here in the church. Uh, yours truly and some others were in charge. And we decided it would be fun about midnight to play flashlight tag here in the sanctuary. You know, one person with a flashlight spotting everyone else. If you get spotted, yep. And so here we were. I'd like to say we were walking humbly and piously throughout the sanctuary. <laughs> but as that beam started coming around, you just heard foot scrambling everywhere running for cover, ducking under the pew, doing this, running, <laughs> searching, stumbling. And about that time, all of the running feet you heard, oh, and the piano keys, <laughs> one of our youth had literally sprawled himself, bumped into the piano in the dark, sprawled himself completely across the keys. Of course, the spotlight comes out, and there he is, <laughs> sprawled out. Unexpectedly, he bumped into some music. I only tell you that because in many ways, that's a part of my faith journey. There was a time in my life when I stumbled around in the dark. And when it came to things, Christian or religious, I ducked, I ran, I hid, I avoided. But by the grace of God, and working through people in my life, I finally bumped into some music. And that music was the music of life and the music of hope and the music of joy. Right in the midst of the darkness, there I was at the mercy of God who was merciful to me through the risen sun. Friends, these are the four urgent questions of Easter. In these questions, we are guided ultimately to the answer of life. And I cannot tell you the date and time when you will finally discover that kind of life. But I can tell you this. You will discover it at the rising of the sun. Let us pray. O oh Lord, you bring us life through your Son, Jesus Christ. Forgive us for those times in which we may have preferred the tomb or sought out life in the midst of death. Forgive us for those times in which we may have 
not lifted the burden of another, but added stones to their journey. And free us on this Easter morning to be who you have created us to be and to represent the living Jesus in our world. So that all the world might know in Christ alone is where we find this life. In Christ alone is where we find hope. In Christ alone is where we find our joy. In his name we pray. Amen.